It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the uh, rumor edition, because Renee Ritchie from iMore is in studio. Is there going to be an iPhone 5S in June? We'll find out. Stay tuned. Mac Break Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 343, recorded March 26th, 2013. Full of Schmidt. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom is not a law firm but provide self-help services at your direction, such as affordable business and personal documents you can trust. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code MBW to receive $10 off at checkout. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for videos, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to Pond5.com slash MacBreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show that covers all your Macintosh news here from the beautiful Bricks Brick House Studios in downtown Petaluma, California. And and I say that because Rene Ritchie found his way here from Montreal. And I used Apple Maps to do it, sir. <laughs> Are we on Apple Maps? Door to door. Yes. Wow. My location was on the right. Your location. Is it nice lady? Is it the Siri voice? Yes, it is. The nuanced Siri lady. Yeah. Your location is on the right. You have arrived. I'd show you a picture, but we're not Google, damn it. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you made it. Nice to Thank have you, you from mymore.com. Good time for you to be here. The rumors are flying yep. fast and furious. Also with us, uh, Andy Anako, tech columnist at the Chicago Sun-Times. Hello. Hello. No hat. Uh, no, I left my hat upstairs. <laughs> just, you know, I have that happen to me. Once I get wired in... To my seat, it's such a it's such a major effort to leave that I just don't go anywhere. No, actually, actually, it was, it was more because of like this. I don't Thursday, Tuesday mornings are usually so busy that this might be one of the two or three times a week I don't actually like wash my hair. Oh, wow. I did actually wash my hair this morning, and so okay, I, you wanted I to. For, you want your freak this, flag this, to fly? <laughs> this is unfortunate. This is unfortunately as good as my hair actually. You're looks. getting as gray as I am, Andrew. Okay. Like, I, I started growing that beard and I gave up, you know, but I but I did note <laughs> that I would have had mutton chops like that actually might have been a little less gray than yours. Yours are very gray. Or is that blonde? <laughs> no, no, they're gray. Yeah. Nope. But Again, he's a young man. He's still a young man. Oh, young, young ish. That's thank you. But bless your heart. And, for... you know, it's good to have hair. That's the thing <laughs> of any kind. And also with us from Seville. No, Valencia. Valencia. Valencia, Spain. Mike Elgin. Yeah. Yeah, they, they actually have a lot of oranges here. Look, it says kind Peloponnese, Greece. We got to fix that. <laughs> You're so <laughs> peripatetic. We should just say that. peripatetic, heart, comma, the my world. Heart is still in Greece. It, you wish you were back in Greece? No, not really. Well, actually, with the weather that we've been having here in Spain recently, yes. But, uh, oh. but no, actually, Valencia turns out to be an incredibly cool city. I bet. So I'm really enjoying it. It's where the oranges come from. Where the oranges, and I also was at Las Fias uh, last week, and that is something for the bucket list, I tell you. What is it? Uh, are, you, are you familiar with this festival? No. It's nuts. What they do, and this, this, pre, this whole tradition predates Christianity, uh, something like 350 neighborhoods have a big contest to build these gigantic, <clears throat> elaborate, cartoonish, Wooden and paper mache statues. They're really. Oh, I saw done. your pictures of the burning of the statues. Yes. On Google Plus. Yeah. So that was and Las so Fias. Have, that's right. They have a party that goes all night, every night for five nights, and then on the end of the fifth night, they torch these things. These. This is in a big city, 20, 30 feet from major buildings, and they have a massive bonfire. <laughs> See, Burning Man didn't invent this. No. No. It's 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 a just crazy, and that the whole week. The kids are running around throwing dangerous firecrackers at tourists and stuff like that. It's really, really crazy. And, of course, everybody's hammered, so nobody cares. But it's really, really crazy, and everybody should do it at least once in their lifetime. These Ninots cost as, as much as $75,000 to make. I mean, they're not burning these 
uh, uh, lightly. These are this is so this this reminds me a little bit of a Mardi Gras celebration. It's kind of like that, except the um, it's it's very unique in that the the revelers don't. There's no costumes per se, other than a lot of people wear traditional Spanish costumes, and then they do these parades. And I kid you not, there was a parade that I saw that was something like eight hours of people in traditional Spanish costumes wandering by. Oh, I want to go to this. Again, burning. I mean, <clears throat> it's really a, a crazy. And the main thing that people do is drink massive amounts of alcohol and eat <laughs> enormous amounts of food. That's I mean, the main thing just, all people do in, yes. in the world. Yeah. It does, well, the, <laughs> doesn't need Las Vegas for that. F-A-L-L-A-S. It's uh, Valencian for the fires. But what they do is they, they they mandate that certain like food things they, they may have churros and they have the special churro like you know Dvorak was determined to say that churros did not exist in Spain <laughs> that there was some sort of American thing. <clears throat> Every corner of every block during Las Vegas had a churro stand, and they're mandated to stay open 24 hours a day yeah. for the entire fest. So you'd be at the 6 o'clock in the morning coming home, and people are eating, lining up for churros. Oh, I would I mean, line up at any time. Really the Nine Oats remain in place until March 19th, the day, no, the day known as La Crema, the burning. Starting in the early evening, young men with axes chop cleverly hidden holes in the statues and stuff them with fireworks. The crowds start to chant, the streetlights are turned off, and all of the nine outs are set on fire at exactly midnight. Over the years, the local bomberos, <coughs> firemen, have devised unique ways to protect the town's buildings from being accidentally set on fire, <laughs> such as covering the fronts with fireproof tarps. Each year, one of the nine outs is spared from destruction by popular vote. This is called the nine out indultat, the pardoned puppet. Sounds like Thanksgiving. And is exhibited in the local museum of the Ninot, along with other favorites. So so this looks pretty big, right? But this is a children's one. Every <sighs> every every one of these statues is a there's a giant one for the adults and a little one for the children. This is a, one of the little ones, and it's about f fifteen feet high, something like that. Wow. The the big one is like two stories high. Three is this why high. you find yourself in Valencia? Were you did you go specifically yes. for that? Yeah, we, we had intended to knock around in Spain for three months. Starting, We started with uh, the Mobile World Congress, and then we're going to uh, go around. And somebody told us that we really have to go to Las Fayas, and so yeah. we came here for a month. And Las Fayas was just hey, incredible. Hey, good news. In June, in Alicante, the Ogueras de San Juan, the bonfires of St. John. Apparently, this is a popular thing in Spain to light burn things Burn your up. way across Spain. <laughs> you can burn your way across Spain. Nation of Pyros. Wow. <laughs> I am so jazzed. This sounds wonderful. This sounds like yeah, something cool. to put on your bucket list, as you said. Definitely. definitely. Wow. Well, there's it's our really little travel log. the economy around, because <laughs> if you're burning things down, that will that will sort of like spurk the construction trades, raw materials, labor. Yeah. Look how if, close if, to the buildings it is. I can't believe they don't have massive fires. It's, it's unbelievable. You, you would never see anything. And when we went to the very last one, the second, you know, the runner-up, they spare the the best one. The second best one, they burn last at half an hour after all the others, and they burn this gigantic one completely in this claustrophobic position near all these buildings. <laughs> and when it was done burning, flaming shrapnel came raining down on the entire city, including all uh, the the million or so people that were there. Holy moly! And I was, I mean, I'm from Southern California, where you know a cigarette right. will set off the whole state. Look at that! And it was. Really crazy. Yeah, this is this is one of the regular burnings. Um, and, and you note that I see the building behind it. That's not an illusion. That building is right there. <laughs> it's a less litigious society. It is. That's what I love. A little danger never hurt anyone. Because they burn well, all the lawyers. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> Mike, no wonder 2.2 million people follow you on Google+. Plus. What amazing images. What did you take that with? Canon uh, EOS 7D. Oh, beautiful image. Yeah. Fire's hard to shoot. Yes, it is. Especially, and when I was taking those pictures, what happened was we were, you know, probably 20 or 30 people back from the front row, and the heat got so bad that people started panicking and pushing back. And so there was like this semi-stampede <laughs> situation of people freaking out from the heat, but... Um, wow. Yeah, but it was it was awesome. I had a, I had a, one of those monopods, the eye stabilizer monopod, and so I was sort of over the crowd, and uh, that worked out pretty well. With my iPhone. Uh, so uh, nice well. to so nice to see you didn't get uh, consumed in flame. <laughs> so this is a jam packed news week. I, there is so much to talk about. 
I don't know where to begin. We could start with uh, Adobe's CTO, Kevin Lynch, going to Apple, which happened right after the show last week, and then we'll work our way through, <laughs> through the week. Um, a lot of people said, whoa, why? This is the guy who did so much to promote uh, Flash for so long. But we had Kevin Marks on uh, This Week in Google uh, uh, last week, and Kevin said, no, no, this is the guy you want. He's the guy who promoted after Flash started promoting SVG and the and the uh, use of HTML5 standards. Um, yeah. So this is this is this is a guy who actually is the right guy. Yeah, and isn't it weird that pe that people are like jumping all over him because my God, while he was a senior executive employee of Adobe, <laughs> he promoted the product that he was responsible for promoting. Like, oh my God, he is tainted with the sign of the beast for having done so. John and, Gruber. Uh, John Gruber said. He is a bozo and a bad hire based on three years yeah. ago writing that Flash was good. But that's stupid. I mean, that's I'm, I'm sorry, rather. I, I, I rather I read that in, in the, this morning and that I'd rather disagree with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, let's, for, or, or at least or at least let's balance that with uh, when Steve Jobs wrote his famous letter saying, here's why we don't support Flash. He made a number of points, most of which proved to be not technically true. Once the first generation of real, like, Flash-enabled tablets come by, came by, it turns out that, no, they don't run hot. No, they, the battery life is roughly what I was get, what I was experiencing with the uh, with the HTML5 video playback. It wasn't any less stable than it was before. There are a lot of reasons why Flash wasn't a great idea for mobile, but it's like, let's at least balance it out by saying there was a lot of snake oil being sold on both sides of that argument. Renee, well, you well, wrote think, uh, that next day, swinging for the stars on Apple's hiring of Kevin Lynch. You think it's a good move? Uh, I, I would... I looked at Gruber. Uh, Gruber's point wasn't that he supported, um, that Kevin Lynch supported Flash while at Adobe, but his point was that while CTO, Chief Technology Officer of Adobe, Kevin Lynch didn't seem to have either the foresight or the power to move Adobe into a more sensible mobile direction. He kind of um, Except that they did. It. Well, they, they were like IE6 in that they, they, they were so far ahead of the market that they right. squandered the technology and they let everyone else catch up with them and they kind of left it. That might be true. And Matt and Reese had a good point where he said, it's hard to tell if Kevin Lynch is the wrong guy or he was just in the wrong job. And I, I tried to look at it from an Apple point of view because Apple has some famously successful external hires like Tim Cook, uh, who came from Compaq, and uh, Phil Schiller, who came from Macromedia, which is where Kevin Lynch got his start. Uh, they also had some really bad ones, like John Browett recently, who everyone saw him coming from Dixon and said, e -e, that's not L the low best. Low-end, budget, yeah. British uh, uh, retailer that he was running, Apple Retail, didn't last. Didn't last at all. Mark Papermaster, they hired him from IBM. IBM sued. They fought to keep him, and then it was a bad a year later, fit. it's like, see you, Mark. So, yeah. But the idea is that uh, they originally it said that he was going to report to Bob Mansfield, which is odd because Kevin Lynch is a software guy. Bob Mansfield does this, the radios. Uh, and the processors. He does core level technology. And then there was another report, I think John Pachowski from uh, All Things D said that he's going to interface between the software and the hardware teams to improve that communications. That wouldn't be a bad thing to have. But yeah, so Apple, uh, at, we talked previously about Apple having a hard time finding engineers, but finding C level talent at Apple, finding vice president talent that they're not promoting from within, but getting fresh eyes, fresh hands, fresh looks at technology, that's really hard. And if there's even a chance that Lynch can do that job, it's worthwhile for Apple to take a swing at it because that's how you find stars. You get people, you empower them, and you see what they can do. Yeah. So you, this is an audacious move. Yes. Potentially f f flawed, but you don't know until you try it. Yeah, absolutely. Who knows where the next Tim Cook or Phil Schiller is going to come from? Yeah, if you think about it, Phil Schiller worked for Macro Media. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> that was not, not the most consumer worse friendly. Than Flash. <laughs> so, yeah. There's also an illusion among among some of the, the uh, sort of... Uh, bloggers and also among the public that these little battles that uh, companies in the industry have are that they take them seriously and and actually believe you know that this person's a bad person and I hate this person and you know that's really not the case at all um, these guys you know it's a virtue to to uh, to have to promote your own product and to the extent that um, that uh, he was unable to make things happen at a different company that was in line with the philosophy of a, a yet another company is really not anything against him. If you look at his whole career, he's been intimately involved with Apple and Apple products for a long, yeah. long time. And uh, and and you know these these not, there's these people in the industry don't take this these rivalries personally at all. You're just looking for good people. Only bloggers do. And he took Creative Suite to yeah. the Creative Cloud, which might be really important for Apple at some point. They got to find some better cloud people. That's for sure. Yeah, and what, he was also working for General Magic for a while on UI, wasn't he? Oh, interesting. Yes. 
Yep. All right. So well, that's, that's where Andy yeah, Rubin that's, that's, came that's from. A nice, of course. That's a nice pedigree. That was a and nice device and lots of lots of Mac connections and Apple. Bill connections. Atkinson worked there, right? Or was it Andy Hertzfeld? Andy Hertzfeld worked. Andy there. Hertzfeld. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So he's no stranger to that crowd. Um. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll also, just wait and see, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's another one of those inside baseball things where, oh goodness gracious, are we going to? Are, are, are we? Are, what, who's the first uh, person who's going to create like a TMZ dot com type <laughs> for website Apple. that just says <laughs> that's a you know, that's a great idea? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I think we have several. <laughs> Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure if I would pay any money for the first Phil Schiller upskirt shot. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> if he if he wants to get out of a limo, I'm not looking. That's all but I'm but I, I think because Tim Cook is still a new CEO, people are looking at his hiring decisions, especially right. post Browett, and it's a factor that people weigh with the stock, and it's a factor that they weigh in covering Tim Cook as you know f full on CEO of Apple. Um. All right. That's the first story. Maybe I should have started with the other story, but it's been fixed, so I guess it's less of a story. Which was. Uh, Apple has added two-factor authentication to your Apple ID. Turn it on. Uh, it's not very onerous, I have to say. I turned it on, and I didn't find it a real yep. problem. But briefly, <laughs> and we, maybe not so briefly, we don't know, but The Verge discovered a very bad hole in Apple's uh, I Forgot page that allowed people who just knew two things, your email address and your birth date, to uh, steal your iCloud account. It was uh, our security writer, Nick Arnott. He saw the story, and without without being able to find or know the steps, he managed he to figure it out at his own in 15 minutes. Because it was a URL, right? Yeah, you it had was a to crafted use URL. A, a crafted URL that I presume handed Apple the uh, birth date and the yeah. uh, and the email. You and had Apple... to sniff the packet to get the what, the format oh, of the URL. And but uh, but if, but you know that in other words. The, even the information The Verge gave out, which was not how to do yes. it, but was sufficient for somebody who was uh, his sophisticated caliber, yeah. to, to figure it out. And then uh, Apple shut it, put it into maintenance mode, but he was able to craft a second URL that went past the maintenance mode. Oh, my mode. God. And he alerted Apple. They fixed that. They took that Jeez. part down. Um, and then he went through and basically explained the attack. But it, it really was just a case of them not securing. Instead of filling out the two security questions, you could just take the URL that would be generated from a successful uh, answer to that, change the ID, Stick that in, send it back to them, wow. and you were in. And it's it's one of those That's things that pathetic. yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know you know that it's trouble when I look at this this breakdown of how this how the people got in thought that's something that I would have thought of. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I because would have thought of that. Yeah. It's, um, now, if you turn if you are able to turn on second factor authentication, all yeah. that goes away. You don't even have security questions anymore, which is a good thing. And it's probably a good idea to lie about your birthday. Like, make up a fictitious birthday and stick with it that you use for some of these services just to get around. Uh, well, you know, I was in. just logging in to see if, you, before the show, uh, to see if Bioshock uh, had a Mac version. And of course, it asks you your birthday. You do that all, any game site you visit, they ask you for your birthday. Now, you could just lie, but it's easier just to go, my birthday, 11 29 56, and then... Now they have it. Now everybody has it. Google has it. Facebook has it. It's a in Quebec, uh, like elsewhere, they ask you your mother's maiden name as a security Another question. Another bad one. But in Quebec, you 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 don't change your name when you marry. The government always calls you by your maiden name, so everybody knows everybody's oh, mother's maiden really name, bad. and yet they still use it as a security question. That's really and bad. And this is a similar thing because your birthday is almost everywhere now, and it still asks as a security question. Yeah, it's 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 really horrible when you realize exactly how much data is being harvested that they that they don't need for the purpose that they're asking you for. Like when they ask for a zip code, it really is to make sure they fix your location. When they're asking for a birthday, yes, possibly it's because they're, they're trying to satisfy age restricted uh, requirements so that they vary from state to state to state on access to content. But they also want that information about what your demographic right. is about. Yeah. There was a, I was just configuring a new, new piece of equipment two days ago, uh, and. Big and like page three of like a page seven, like as you walk through of setting up the services. Oh, we need your credit card information. Said, so, well, no, I'm going to leave those field bl fields blank. I'll push the big orange button that says next. Is I'm sorry, all these fields are required. And as I'm about to like get my self righteous, no, you have no need. You don't have. You don't need my credit card information for what I'm about to ask you to do. Then after I'm about, I get my temper down about ten notches. Realize, oh, okay, this is tiny, tiny little piece of HTML text in light gray on the white background that says no thanks that I can click to actually get rid of it. Just hoping that people are not going to think about like, providing that kind of information, including your address, including your phone number, when you actually don't have to do so. So that's why, uh, I mean, it's, phishing comes in all forms and sizes now. And sometimes it's not just the Russian mob that's trying to get your bank information. It's these regular commercial websites that's trying to add more data than they actually need for you. It's so, important to point out there, and they're asking the chat room, uh, tooth, 
two-factor authentication from Apple is only available in four countries, I think, right now. The U.S., no. the U.K. It's not available in Canada, so it isn't. So what do you do? You change your birth date. And so yeah. that's, it sounds like a silly answer, but that's Presuming the right that, this, that there's something like this still yeah. out there. I mean, they fixed this one. Although it's interesting because Nick Arnott at iMore came up yeah. with actually a different way. Yes. Than the original, so he reverse engineered something that was another way. Yeah, of doing absolutely. It. it was an insecure procedure, and he, <laughs> there was multiple ways to attack the insecurity of that procedure. Wow, they call it a uh, cross-site uh, forging vulnerability. Yeah, or CSRF. Uh, wow, <laughs> it's disappointing. I had an interesting, uh, Sorry, I had an interesting experience with that two-factor authentication for Google services uh, on the last day of Las Vegas when they were burning everything. Um, which we were warned is pickpocket paradise. Somebody lifted my iPhone. Oh. Uh, I handed it to my wife. She dropped it in her purse. And then by the time uh, the, the entire city had been burned to the ground, it was gone. And so, <laughs> and so I, I had, this is a few days, a couple days, uh, two or three days before Apple announced uh, it, the two-factor authentication. But I had Google's uh, going, but I had it set up. It was for, on the phone. My iPhone. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so there's a, a process when you set up two-factor authentication with Google, where you have these like secret codes, and you're supposed to print it out and put it in your, you know, some, you know, this is a whole thing. But it's not full. That's not foolproof either, because I just ha had it end up turning it off, changing all my passwords, and then coming back later and setting it up with a different way for them to reach me to confirm the secret codes. But there's just there's no substitute for like. Uh, um, uh, you know, changing your birth date, uh, making sure you chain your phone to your physical body. You know, there two-factor authentication isn't isn't the ultimate solution either, unfortunately. And as <laughs> I do, I, I do like the way that Apple set it up, though. It uh, as soon as I heard two-factor authentication, I thought. Dang, does it mean that every time that I want to make a purchase, I have to make sure that I have my iOS device with me, even though I'm not making that purchase on this uh, for this device specifically? They only ask for it at times when you're about to crack open your security in a, in a major way, like uh, approve a new uh, a new device or approve a new payment method or make changes to your personal information. So, Yeah, it doesn't bother you a lot. In fact, I thought it would see it on uh, the iTunes store on my iPad, and I never did. And the nice thing about so, it, too, is it'll send an SMS sure that's good. <laughs> or it'll send a find my iPhone request, which means that if you don't have an iOS device, but you have another phone, you can still get the SMS version of it. Right. So it is, is limited cross-platform support. And I guess we should point out that, Mike, it, it even if they have your Google Authenticator on your phone, they still need your password. And, and I guess if you have that in, on the phone in some form, mm -hmm. you could be in trouble. Uh, there, there's a, a, a there's another funny part of the story. It's funny now. It was horrible at the time, but um, what happened was uh, this all happened at like three o'clock in the morning, and we've been drinking gallons of sangria and just I mean it was just a, a we, you know watching incredibly loud fireworks at the same time these huge bonfires are going on. So sensory overload. I was like in this really weird state of mind. Mind. So uh, I have a uh, the type of uh, iPhone case that has a wallet inside. So. Uh, all my credit cards were gone too, and so they probably I just threw away the phone and took the credit cards. Well, no, I think they, I think they, well, I, I don't know what they did with the credit cards, but I think they just wanted the phone because oh. uh, several things. We went to a Starbucks, which was the only thing open with Wi-Fi that we could find. Then I, I used um, uh, another iPhone, an older iPhone that I have, through the Wi-Fi to call the credit card companies to cancel my credit cards. And while I was doing that, talking to the guy, I was simultaneously using Find My iPhone, and I wanted to wipe the iPhone. And so I saw Mike's iPhone. I wiped it, and I what the the phone that I wiped was the one I was using to call. Oh. Uh. And, and I looked at it, and suddenly it was being wiped. <laughs> and then I looked, I looked at my list, and every phone that I've ever had is still listed as as a wipeable device on Find My iPhone. I just saw the first one and wiped it, which was really dumb. But there was three or four of them. And, and there was no differentiation between them. So anyway, it's uh, you, you really have to prepare for this stuff because stuff does happen. And you have to have a really clear plan, which I did not do. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of learning this the hard way. Wow, what a bummer. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was no big, totally worth it. I would sacrifice an iPhone every year to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mike, can, can, I, can I say that you were drunk and near huge fires. Losing your phone was not the worst thing you could have. <laughs> That's right. My breath could have caught on fire. Something now, are you like going that. to Pompolona to run the Bulls next? Is that your next uh, feat of, you know, amazing uh, macho machismo? 
I doubt it. That's, <laughs> uh, just, uh, uh, chase, uh, having a uh, cheeseburger chasing me is not uh, my idea of a good time. But I, 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 uh, we don't know where we're going to go. Probably going to go to Northern Africa, take wow. a couple of trips. Have but fun. Um, Yeah, but we'll, we'll be back in the U.S. in time for Google I.O. So. so also uh, Apple pushed out 6.1.3 because if you had, as, as I do on your iPhone, you know, the, the password mm -hmm. lock, easy to bypass that. <laughs> and this one has been bypassed now too. The new one is bypassed yeah. again? Because yeah. the last time you were here, they'd fixed it and bypassed yeah. it, and now it's bypassed again. Yeah, I believe so. So in other words, that fix it's isn't... Hard. And uh, the Samsung has had theirs bypassed. That's right. It, it, it's non-trivial to provide access to emergency calling and photography and lock down the whole thing. Ah, that's the problem, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And you can only get access to it with for camera and contacts because that's the stuff that they have to leave open for. Right. So that's not so bad. It's, it's not it's, like they it's can not, get your authentic It's suboptimal, but it's... Sub, yeah, yeah, it's not perfect. Apple uh, made an acquisition of a company called Wi-Fi Slam. And uh, apparently it's an indoor location company, although we now know what the slam means. Simultaneous location and mapping. There you go. I thought it was like a shot to the head. So Wi-Fi Slam. Leo, Leo, could, could, you, could you give Renee a dollar right now for having remembered that? He knew it right <laughs> off the top of his head. I An read American it. dollar. I've been reading it all I, week, I, and I, I still don't remember it. Four, I would not have gotten all four. So um, the problem is that GPS, of course, doesn't work indoors. Mm -hmm. Google, among, uh, I would presume, others, but Google for sure has <laughs> convention hall mapping, airport mapping, a lot of in, uh, shopping mall mapping. That I presume they're using the Google Street View to, to do. Uh, and then I, I, I would guess triangulation of Wi-Fi access points, right? Yep. Is this the same idea? This, uh, as far as I understand it, it, it does use different Wi-Fi and different signal points, and it tries to figure out what the resistance would be. I mean, Matthew Panzerino did a really good article at the Next Web that Leo's looking at right now. And it, it tries to adjust for the material composition, but it's not... Apple bought C3 Technologies a little while ago. They were the company that did the helicopter and airplane flying to map right. buildings. And with this company, you press a button, it shows your location on the phone, then you walk through hallways, and it uses your location to map um, the passage through the building. So it's, it's not sort of a magic solution. It sounds to me more like something Apple would use to generate maps than a company that's already going to provide us with maps. Right. Uh, but yeah. Well, for one of the issues it's, is, it's, and you see this all the time in apartment buildings, you can't tell what floor you're on. Yeah. Because the meat, the so if you're in a mall with four floors, you don't know where you are. Civilian GPS is not allowed to be exact enough right. uh, to tell you the difference in stories, much less local distance. Yeah. But they, but this system is doing so many clever things, like trying to figure using yeah. not just not just GPS, not just Wi-Fi, but here is the accelerometer, here is the gyroscope, here is a point at which he is he seems this person seems to be moving faster rather than slower. They're doing You're dead doing reckoning. Different. That's called dead reckoning. They're doing that. Yeah. Well, well, not not just that, but it's things like you, you, if someone is moving uh, moving uh, faster rather than slower, that is an indication that they're walking in a straight line, no matter what all the other the other sensors are, are telling them. Now, I got to uh, point uh, out that they're not just recording this for you, but in order for this to work, they have to record everybody who's in this yep. building, their location yep. as oh, they wow. guess it. So, what it's saying to me is that if I'm carrying around an, an iPhone, that it's constantly sending not just location information, but uh, accelerometer information. Angle mm -hmm. information and other no, stuff it, back, it, right? It, it really, it. I'm, I'm not sorry, that I Mike, care, but well, it re it really depends on how Apple chooses to implement mm -hmm. this technology. Remember, this is all guesswork at this point. We know the technology is. We don't know how to what extent Apple's going to use it. But let's say we go for the uh, the uh, the alternate reality in which Apple is a bunch of greedy, non privacy uh, respecting bastards. Uh, they could uh, a, a a company that is more like Google, more like Facebook than Apple. Let's put it that way. Could if they had their phone, they could put this technology in and make sure that anytime there is somebody running their operating system in this building, it is collecting this information. And essentially, every ant that leaves a trail is giving more information about what those trails are. Uh, and that one person running this software is not going to give uh, Facebook useful information. But a hundred people using this software without their knowledge every single day would give a very, very interesting profile of here is where all the paths are. And then you hand that information off to a central server that can sort of transpose that into, okay, this is a hallway, this is a place where people move and then stop, so this must be a congregation area. So it could be one of those places where uh, crowdsourcing could produce a very, very consistent map of something like 
like you know uh, on the on the plus side uh, something like an amusement park something like a, a shopping center or a mall on the negative side something like a business of 40 to 50 people or a school or something like that so it would be it would be a good thing if it, this is a simple way for uh people who want their public spaces to be mapped to create these very, very accurate maps. Like assume that uh, uh, you have employees of a mall and that basically you, you give your security guards like each a phone and just and, and over the course of walking through the mall every day for months, they produce accidentally a beautiful map with their knowledge. That could be a very good thing if it turns out that without your knowledge, you're entering a building that the building that you go to work in every single day has been mapped down to a six, uh, a six inch uh, uh, resolution and now anybody can not only find out what how to get from one point to another inside your building but even a point where they can figure out that hey okay he, the, the accelerometer data from andy's phone indicates he's probably on the third floor and probably in the northwest quadrant of the building he is typically in this office so i bet he is in this office today on tuesday but, but that's that's really what, what they're going to have to do to be not facebook which is completely be able to prove that they can decouple the data from the individual mm -hmm. and they and can't they can, and i'll show you why they can't in a moment you know what they may have just really the test yeah they may have they may have hired these people because this is just brilliant freaking yeah. stuff yeah. i mean yeah. it's, they, they, they're looking at things like if you've got it's, they, they measure footfalls right because mm -hmm. they can tell from the accelerometer okay that was a step but then they cut then they take all this data and they mash it together and they look for patterns and uh, and they're able from that in very, I think this very high-end computer science. I saw uh, two years ago, I, I came across a paper uh, from uh, a, graduate, a graduate paper that tried to figure out where a coffee machine was inside a building <laughs> based on what times do people stop at a certain location and how much time do they spend there. And that's just an example of if you have a, a large enough data set and a clever enough mind uh, looking at that data set, you can pop out all kinds of really interesting information. And so wh whether whether uh, whether this is a, an invasion of personal privacy or not, just like sometimes you really you really have to respect how good a hack is and how clever it is. This is some really smart technology that but, you just but I, 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 yeah, I wonder how, how much more of an invasion of privacy this is than what is pretty standard, which is that your phone is going around mapping where the Wi-Fi locations are. And the reason that's something of a of a of a privacy uh issue is that the the wi-fi uh nodes in question could be in your house inside people's house yeah. without their permission so it's not only the users no permission but it's the wi-fi owners but, but remember no, mike there's... it's not just sending the location it's not just sending the wi-fi information it's sending every bit of data coming off of that phone the accelerometer they do that for traffic uh, on highways and, and now. let me point you to this uh, article stop, stop. in nature that just came out um from uh some university researchers who basically said, after studying 15 months of human mobility data for one and a half million people, that all they take really is four points and they can identify 95% of us who we are based on those four points of data. So this massive amount of data is sufficient for people. Now, you have to make the decision about whether it's worth it to you. It's worth it to yeah. me. I, don't, I couldn't care less if somebody knows where I am. But... Yeah. If you're in the witness protection program, maybe you should care. And does Apple well, care? Not, not, and not, certainly not, not, Apple cares. I mean, they're collecting the data. It doesn't even matter if Apple cares. If that database is, is lost, that's true. That that stuff has huge uh, value. Remember that this is but, the same company that was crowdsourcing traffic information mm -hmm. and leaving it as an open file that pretty right. much anybody could access. Uh, but yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. You've been trying to talk. I, mean, I think I'd uh, I think I just no. I, I just the, the problem with this, with using this technology on a permission basis is nobody will grant that permission. There's no way to ask permission that doesn't sound horrible. Oh, we we're going to track everything on your phone. You know, this is a memo from corporate headquarters. We want to map the inside of the building, and so we'd like to map every step you take, every place, the the, the angle of your phone, everywhere, you, every time you're in the, the men's room. We're going to know what your phone is in there. Don't worry. Uh, you know, your your data will be protected. Nobody's going to agree to that. So you, in order to use it, you'd have to... I, I'm, I'm kind of... You, I'm kind of thinking about remember that Kickstarter project of the stainless steel really cool iPhone case that they ship they they then figure out that when you put a stainless steel band around the iPhone you sort of hide the <laughs> antenna from everybody. Yeah. I think that's going to be now a very very popular item the known as the privacy yeah. band the the, the chastity right. belt for your iPhone. And, and I, I would pay eighty dollars to make sure that nobody can get access to any of the data inside my phone in any wireless yeah. network. And let's point out that Apple recently updated its privacy policy to say to, it was going to share spatio-temporal location of your of their users with partners and licensees. Yeah. I don't know what spatio-temporal location means, but I think it means anything they want. 
I don't want to keep people space. up, but the, the, this stuff goes on all the time. Like whenever you go to a store and you buy a can of Coke or you buy potato chips, right. they collect that information, and it takes very little effort to build a profile of you as a shopper and very few unique identifiers, and they do it to try to figure out what kind of coupons w are the best value for them to give, but <laughs> they're still creating these profiles of us all the time in almost every industry now. So and and that's what's interesting about big of, data the is... Though, yeah. The, the difference, though, is that if I really worry about that, I can simply not use the Price Club card when I make my purchase. It's not like when I walk into a when I walk into a store uh, uh, as part of the license, as part of the deal that I'm making with the store of selling me uh, this bottle of Diet Coke for a dollar seventy nine, that I have to tell them who I am when, uh, and uh, what time of day I've made this purchase. And share well, they don't need the card anymore, though. They they have such a big volume set, and they're doing it's called customer insight analytics and market basket analysis. They can usually figure out who you are based on buying patterns, and you know sometimes it's tied to phone numbers, sometimes it's tied to other metrics, but it's we don't need the club card anymore. I know. I, well, I know. I, I know of those systems, and there there are ways to opt out of it. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Not as though, it's, it's not as though me walking to a random gas station, they're going to identify me if I pay cash. There have been some interesting studies quoted in this article. Uh, in one study, a medical database was successfully combined with a voters list to extract the health record of the governor of Massachusetts. So, you know, I mean, you could think of a lot of nefarious uses mm -hmm. for this. Uh, let's say uh, the Westboro Baptist Church actually got some intelligent people there, <laughs> and they decided that they wanted to watch a million people, and if anybody went near an abortion clinic, wipe their iPhone or do something. This, All of this stuff is possible, yep. given yep. this the, the availability of this domestic data. Domestic surveillance. The, 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 domestic, the, the data, and so the point really is the data is being collected. <laughs> it's pretty clear now. Apple's got a very big horse in this mm -hmm. race. Uh, Google certainly has for yep. a long time. Uh, databases are combined from a variety of sources, can give you a very accurate profile of yourself. It's very difficult to opt out. Yeah. Uh, I guess you could, but it's very difficult. You could move to Valencia. It's very difficult to opt out. And companies like work. Skyhook are doing it on small, like small companies also are doing it. And there's benefit. There's certainly benefit to us for this. So those are the data points. I don't know what you make of that. I think the biggest oh. problem is that the human mind is not capable of projecting or predicting what <clears throat> big data and machine learning are right. capable of extracting. There's well, just, this is a surprise. So Four location points is enough to identify a person, an individual, yeah. in 95% of the cases. Yeah. That's how unique where we go is. Yeah, exactly. And most and most people just aren't aware of this. I had but uh, holidays are kind of dangerous for me because <laughs> I sometimes keep talking and I don't really I'm not taking a, the temperature of what I'm saying is having a reaction on people in the room. And so <laughs> someone was we're at a, a table with like 12 or 13 people and someone was talking about, "Oh, I don't really care if this company knows about this." And as it was as as it happened, I was doing like a, a lot of research on that particular topic, and I said, "Well, here is the amount of information that I can get off of you if I just know two of these random things you don't not interested in protect and I'm just talking, 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 and I see this person's face get a little wider and a little wider and a little wider <laughs> because they they just don't they don't understand that this is an act. It's we're we're used to the idea that when you enter a casino, the, the that environment is designed to make sure you stay there and keep keep losing money for as long mm -hmm. as possible. If they can do that by depriving you of your sense of time, depriving you of your higher logic functions, they will play every trick to do that. And what people need to understand is that data mining is such a lucrative business that it turns the world into a casino like that, where anytime they can they can get one piece of information out of you, and anytime they can by buying off some grad student's thesis project uh, and integrating this into another data set to figure out to hook up one innocent little d database with another in innocent little database, they're definitely going to do it. And the concern is that the opt out button is being grayed out in more and more of our of our uh, of our situations. And even a company like Apple, I don't think, is necessarily immune from this. I'm sorry, I'll I'll I'll, I'll spin this down because I, once again, I'm shooting my mouth off a little bit. But I mean, we we I don't trust Facebook at all because their corporate policy is the world is there to be shared with everything. So we're our it's our job is to collect as much much information as possible and share it with as many people as possible. Google is more trustworthy only because. They want to increase profits for Google and not the entire world, uh, but they are still designed to target ads towards me personally. That gives them a great incentive to identify my, me and my habits personally. I trust Apple most of all, but not because I don't believe that they are never going to try to pull information about my life, but because they are going to make sure that that is only applied towards Apple products. So 
I don't think that there is a halo around Apple's data collection policies. I just simply believe that the amount of damage that they can do with the information they're collecting from me as an iPad user, as an iPhone user, as a Mac user is not as great as it would be on other devices. The, the other problem, though, is that you, you mentioned, do I trust Google? Do I trust Apple? Um, so, you know, this is where Siri and Google now are, are going. They're going in a direction of collecting maximum amounts of information, uh, all this stuff that we're talking about times 100. But then there are all these startups and they're coming out with really like Grokker and easily do. Google's field trip is awesome. MindMeld, I don't know if you're familiar with MindMeld. There's another one called Sherpa. These startup, uh, these little tiny companies are giving you these incredible benefits uh, in exchange for tracking every single thing that you do and every single place that you go. And everybody's going to love these apps. And there's going to be a lot of them. So this this data is going to be flying in every direction, and somebody's going to be selling it. It's it's really going to be an issue that 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 somebody's going to have to deal with, or just give up. Not, I can okay. allay fears. Uh, you have zero privacy. Well, it's certainly for, for sure that if you carry a cell phone, you've opted in. Yeah. Period. Yep. So stop carrying a cell phone. Credit cards, you got to yep. throw those away. Got to use cash only. Anything that ain't going to last too long, <laughs> huh? Anything with RFID on it. Yeah. <laughs> Passport. I mean, you could do it, but you're going to be you're, you're going to be mightily inconvenienced. And so I just gave up. If I can assuage people's fears, though, before I worked at iMore, I spent 10 years in high-end analytic databases, like oh. bit, bit vector databases, oh. columnar decomposition, the whole just bit. Move over a little bit. Uh, here. And no, but the thing is that it was incredibly hard to sell because people just wanted to buy Oracle. And it, right. it's going to take anymore, a generation. Of, <laughs> it's going to take a generation of people to really get this technology, understand it, because HP bought Vertica, did nothing with it. Right. There's all sorts of really amazing technologies that are squandered because these companies don't really understand them yet. And that's or maybe sensitive change. to this kind of uh, yeah. uh, uh, backlash from consumers who say you're collecting what about who. You know what? I don't think that's good. But that, it's a hugely lucrative business. There are companies that all they do is collect oh, data sure. and, based on merchants and sell that data back to merchants and their competitors. And right. that's going to be the next sort of Google AdSense uh, massive ad marketing buys. We're going to have to live with it, I think. But uh, what certainly donor. if you want to use technology, you're going to have to live with it. And why Wi-Fi Slam is these guys are really smart. Yeah. I mean, just based on what yeah. I've read about them. Yeah. They made they made a uh, sample program for oddly enough for uh, Android. Mm -hmm. Never released on the, the iPhone. That's been pulled off the Android store, but it showed what they could do with the data they have. And it's I think this is a little scary, and brilliant. You can see why Apple yeah. wants them. Yeah. In fact, they may not do any of this stuff. They may just want these guys. Yeah. As as God said in the movie, there is no up without a down. There is no inside without an outside. There is no bad without a good. So they, they I'm may, sure this they is, may just need it for stuff. their circular campus. How do you find anything? Exactly. When everything's in a circle? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's it's based on NASCAR. Just keep making left turns. You'll get there eventually. <laughs> and this is like the fourth, I think, the fourth mapping company they bought in recent years. They bought PlaySpace and Poly9 and C3 Technologies, and so they needed to. Yeah, we know that. They, and, and what it shows is they're all in on yeah. this stuff. They're, this is they're not going to sit back. Major area of interest. They really want this to work. More yeah, than major. a hobby. More than a hobby. <laughs> they came late, but they came when they smelled the money. <laughs> they brought the bank. Well, you know, there is an opportunity. Okay, I'll say there is an opportunity for Apple here. And you you kind of framed that conversation right at the beginning, Andy, when you said, if you trust Apple. What if what if a company could really earn your trust in terms of data privacy, but still offer you the benefits of it, but say, but and Apple really, I think, is trying to position themselves this way. Look, we're collecting this data, but we're not sharing. This is an opportunity for somebody to say, we're going to be the privacy company, but we're still going to give you the benefits of all this data. Because Isn't that a great opportunity? A differentiator. It's 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 always a transaction. I mean, for for everything that you can say negatively about Google, and there's a lot you can say about the, how they collect data, they are giving you wonderful free products that would probably cost the average consumer at least twelve hundred dollars a year if they had to pay for all this sort of stuff. Uh, and there are a bunch of articles out there about well, if you, let's let's say you don't let's say you want to cut your access to Google and you want to. Uh, you want to really invest in privacy rather than in uh, the full portfolio of features. You can get uh, mail systems that work on your own personal servers that cost money. You can uh, use uh, run something uh, similar to Google Reader uh, and have that on your own on a server that you control. There are pay services uh, that promise that whatever data that you generate and whatever social map you create on the social network belongs to you and can be accessed by nobody else. But unfortunately. 
uh, the two costs are one money because these people need to be if they're not going to be making money off of selling your data they need to keep the lights on and maybe keep, you know put some food into the bellies of their children uh, but also uh, it's going to cost in terms of ease of use most there there is a threshold that you could call like the I don't care anymore threshold where uh, I, I would love to have a, a a fresh a fresh barbecued roast chicken uh, until I find out how complicated it is to like produce like a real like you know uh, commercial grade <laughs> commercial grade roast. At which point I thought maybe I will go to Chipotle and give that nice man six dollars and thirty five cents, and he will hand me a burrito instead of my spending four hours in the kitchen. There, a lot of people care about privacy, but it quickly crosses their I don't care about this anymore threshold when you tell them here's how much you have to learn about how networks work and how encryption works uh, in order yep. to really have uh, security and privacy uh, on the Internet. And there are also kids growing, growing up and becoming teenagers in, in a world where privacy feels like it's completely gone already. And yeah. they accept it very quickly. And so, you know, the, those of us who remember an era where we couldn't be tracked 24-7 uh, are more sensitive to privacy issues than somebody who's 15 or 20 right now who, you know, it just seems like a pointless concern. Absolutely. Yeah, but wait till there's a, you know, picture of them telling jokes about dongles posted on the Twitter and they yeah. lose their jobs. They might be a little more concerned about it all of a sudden. But who, who are you going to hire? Because you're going to have that kind of data on everybody. So, well, we have to, yeah, we're in the, it's, it, yeah, that's, it's like for a while, if you'd smoked pot, that was a, yeah. a strike against you to be president of the United States. Not anymore. Not so much anymore. Right. Yeah. It'd be pretty hard to find somebody who hadn't had at least inhaled. Yeah. And, and even cocaine might, might be okay now. So it's like, it's a great uh. time to run for president for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At, at, at the same time, we try to we, maybe we would we old timers will try to explain to you know uh, people who are like fourteen to twenty three that you shouldn't be you should you should care about this stuff. It's amazing to us that you don't think that's dangerous, but at the same time, you know those of us who grew up during the Cold War, Cold War, like didn't you you did you woke up every morning knowing that at any point nuclear bombs could rain down <laughs> and destroy all of civilization? And I can't believe you're being so blasé about it. Well, I mean, we just... What are you going to do? That it was gonna happen. Cover. Exactly. What are you going to do? Of, it's part of life. Our president is an idiot. Well, <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm not really up for armed insurrection. I'd much rather deal with the risk of being bombed to death. Yeah, mo most of us... Exactly. Most of us just kind of go along. Andy get, go the along to get along. Uh, we're going to take a break. Come back with more. Andy Anako from the Chicago Sun-Times. Renee Ritchie from imore.com. Mike Elgin from Valencia, Spain. And Google+. Plus where he is still the last man standing. I like to tease him on that. Uh, I'm not really standing. You know, they just released a new iOS uh, uh, update on Google+. Plus. It's, again, Beautiful. better and better and better. It's becoming like the iOS app that no one uses. Yeah. No, it's it's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a funny thing about Google+. Plus. There's, there's a very hardcore group of people in the U.S. who love it. Right. But this is a radically international service. That oh, that's interesting. Where the rest of the world is definitely on it. And so it's it's just, it's a different, it's it's kind of outside of the, the, the normal tech bubble where a lot of people in tech journalism are not into it, but they're a minority. Uh, globally, it's huge, huge, it huge, huge. Plus. That's very interesting. Yeah, Orkut yeah. Uh, never took off in no. the U.S., predated yeah. uh, Facebook, uh, but it was huge in Brazil, not so much anymore. <clears throat> Facebook is now it, one over. It was huge in, in Brazil, and secondarily, it was huge in India. Um, but the numbers, even for in India and Brazil, are, are getting uh, ginormous on Google Plus. And there's another thing that happens. Why is that, that, Mike? Do you think they're 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 more they trust Google more than Facebook? Um, well, actually, I read something recently that was very interesting, which is that Facebook and Google both have these subsidized uh, cell phone services in a lot of the third world, mm -hmm. where they will basically reduce the the cost of of the uh, data plan, but you get this kind of AOL of just Facebook or just Google services. Ew. And so a lot of people around the world, they, they, when they, when they, their only computer is a, is a phone, is a smartphone, it's their first smart, smartphone, they're often upgrading from a feature phone. And to get the subsidized rate, they're getting just Google services, for example. That's one small reason. I don't know what the impact of that is, probably pre pretty insignificant. But I, I, I do think that there's a lot of affinity, that there's a lot less affinity for every latest startup, every latest thing, which we have in Silicon Valley, 
uh, um, and more affinity for like, oh, I know Google. Oh, I use, I've been using Google search for a long time. I've been using Gmail for a long time. That's a, that's a brand that I trust. So there's a different mentality uh, and a le- less of a likelihood to jump on the latest thing. Plus they get on it and it's really, really nice. And they can, you know, they're finding a lot. Like, you know, I get on and I have, if I mention something about Saudi Arabia, for example, which I often do, um, I just get flooded with all these people come out of the woodwork from Saudi Arabia, English speaking Saudis, uh, and we have these wonderful debates, and then I'll mention another country, and all those people come out of the woodwork. It's very, very international, and it doesn't hurt that there's a, there's a really great Chrome plugin that just instantly translates all the comments into whatever your language is. And so, people who don't even speak the same language are having these really rich conversations. So, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. We certainly uh, have had good results with the communities for uh, all almost yeah. all of our shows. Um, yeah. Good engagement and stuff, but we don't. We're not there to get everybody who watches or listens to shows involved. We're just, if we can get yeah. a few thousand people who are engaged and participating, that's a great platform. Going for to it. where the viewers are. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. What time is it in Valencia? Oh, it's not bad. It's uh, eight thirty. Oh, it's early yeah. yet. Yeah. Plenty of time before they set the town on fire. <laughs> That's right. I got time to run. That's right. <laughs> our, our show today brought to you by LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom is not a law firm. They're a, um, they provide self-help legal services at your direction, which means you can use them to do personal and uh, business legal documents you can trust. There are, and if you need advice from an attorney, they even can help you with that, with the pre-negotiated prices in their legal plan in most states. Uh, you can see reviews of the attorney's profiles so you know what you're getting. I'll give you an example. You know, when we uh, started Twit, I wanted to make it an LLC. I don't know why. I just got it in my mind. I shouldn't start a business without some protection. And an LLC for a startup seemed like the simplest thing. 99 bucks. A few questions and boom. And we're still using those LLC papers, even though we now have a law firm <laughs> and lots of lawyers. And the cost, I can tell you, is a lot more than LegalZoom. But that LLC stands, and it's great. Um Trademarks, copyrights, patents, NDAs, regular corporations, too. You could do it all at LegalZoom.com for a lot less. And frankly, you know it's everything that you need to know. If you don't, for instance, there was one question. I've mentioned this before I came up with was, wh what state should I incorporate in? Some said Delaware, some said California. So I would have loved to have asked an attorney, well, what do you think? And now with the LegalZoom, you can. They've got that legal plan attorney, an extensive network that in most, available in most states that can give you advice one question, two, at a very affordable price. Twelve years LegalZoom's been around. Two million Americans have used them, not just for business, too. Uh, wills, just 69 bucks. If you don't have a will, you better make one, especially if you've got kids. You don't want the government or courts to decide what happens to your kids. You want to, you want to say before that day. You could establish a living trust at LegalZoom.com. Um, if you are a blogger, maybe you want to trademark your blog title. Think about that. I'm more trademarked, I'm sure. Uh, I, I, we've applied for sure. I don't know how yeah, far well, it is. Yeah, it takes a little while to, to get it, but that's, you know, you don't want to mess around with that kind Absolutely. of stuff. Uh, you don't want somebody coming along and saying, yeah, I'm I'm more. No, I'm I'm more. And especially with all the different scraper sites, it's it's bad. Yeah. Simple thing to do, and it's not expensive. NDAs, maybe you've invented something and you want to share it with a company. Maybe they want to make it, but you might want to have an NDA to protect you. It's all there, LegalZoom.com. Again, not a law firm, but uh, self-help services at your specific direction. But you can speak to a legal plan attorney to get your questions answered and get ongoing advice for a special thank you for using LegalZoom. Use our offer code MBW, and we'll give you 10 bucks off your uh, purchase at LegalZoom.com. Just a little, you know, just to encourage you to use MBW as the offer code so they know you saw it here. LegalZoom.com. Um, T-Mobile iPhone, Leo. Yeah, T-Mobile has announced. They announced it this morning. They're going to have the iPhone come April. Yep. Uh, for how much? Ninety nine bucks, right? It is an incredibly complicated thing. formula. <laughs> oh, so it's not oh, just it's here's ninety nine bucks. Give me my iPhone five, because they're getting rid of the contracts. Yeah, but you 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 put down ninety nine bucks, and then you pay twenty dollars a month for two years. Oh, and it ends up being the total price ends up being lower than the amount you paid to just get an unlocked phone. So it's a really good deal. And then you're your, your your data and phone plan is separate from that, but not on a contract. It actually seems like a really cool deal to me. They're going to have uh, the HTC One, too, which is uh, something I've been very interested in. Um, Same price. That's tempting. And they're eliminating uh, early termination fees? They're eliminating contracts or no? It's 
uh, so here's the big problem in the U.S. market is that people are used to subsidized phones. They're used to going into an AT&T or a Verizon and getting the $0, $100, $200 right. phone. And lots of people have tried to go to the contract-free phone where you just pay outright and then pay your service. And it seems really expensive. That's how Ting does it. But people. yeah, then yeah. it's a $600 phone. So they're mitigating. T-Mobile's not... I mean, you, you can walk in there and buy an unlocked phone and just pay your money for it and go about your business. But uh, they don't want to lose a customer who comes in and right. says, why is it so expensive? So they also have ways where you can pay part of the phone and then prepay more of it. Uh, it's an interesting middle ground. It is more complicated than going to a, a pure um, contract-free model, but I think it's smart given the U.S. market. And there are you do have to pay fees if you try to terminate earlier and, and whatnot. So it is more complicated. Than it, may, than it has to be, but I think that's the realities of their market. But it's, it's certainly fairer. I mean, the, the AT&Ts of the world, the, the standard contract thing, the whole business model is designed to bury and hide the details of what you're paying for and when right. so that they get more money. That, for example, if you, if, you, if you get a phone every single time after two years and, and you, get a, you, know, you can get the, the, the new phone subsidized right on schedule, <laughs> then you can argue that you might be paying for that phone what it costs. But if you delay three, four, five months, you're still paying for the phone even after you right. paid for it right. until you get another phone. It's such a ripoff and they just are harvesting cash from all these users because there's so much confusion built into a regular subsidized but That's phone how plan. a mortgage model works. Like you end up paying more for your house on a mortgage than if you bought it up front. It's right. just a, yes. It's, it's called interest. Yeah, yeah. yep. But it's, but it's marketed interest, and you know what the annual percentage rate is. You know what you're paying. Yeah. You know what portion is principal, what portion is interest. The phone, this is, I think you're right, Mike. I think clarity is really what we yes. want. Just tell me. You know, well, and it's, it, That's the devastating thing for the, 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 the conventional carriers because they don't want anybody setting a precedent for clarity about what you're paying for. <laughs> that's that's a disaster for them. Yeah. <laughs> They're doing this, this, uh, you know, this kind of economic, uh, predictably irrational stuff where they go, yeah, but yeah. it's only, and that's why I, I I always do this. We review these phones. So it's a cheap phone. It's fifty dollars. It's zero dollars. That's irrelevant. The yes. price up front is a is the smallest part of what you're going to pay the over two years. Total for that cost phone. of ownership. It's the total cost of ownership that matters. And a, a fifty dollars at the beginning less is not really saving you much money. And the second part of this was their LTE announcement. I think it's four, seven cities. Yeah. yeah, not you know. This is really the thing that holds people back from T-Mobile. It's HSPA Plus, although yeah. because nobody uses T-Mobile, I use it. It's not bad. It's pretty fast. And they've got, right, originally they were AWS Spectrum, so not the same Spectrum as AT&T, and not all phones supported it, but they've been rolling out more 3G HSPA on regular frequencies, and it sound, it's and not bad. I don't bad. know if you saw it or not, but I don't know if they said whether the iPhone on T-Mobile will work on AWS or not. Oh, that's a good question. I missed it. I don't know. I, Baltimore, I think, I think Houston, Kansas City, Las Vegas, Phoenix, San Jose, and Washington, D.C. will be the first LTE cities. Now, they're getting, they're, they're acquiring oh, yeah, Metro they PCS. So that will add to um, more uh, LTE on the AWS frequencies. What were you pointing at? Yeah, whether it says it's AWS for their regular iPhone, but it looks like. Looks like it might be because that's their big thing. Is it has to be? There's more. They have a lot more faster internet on HSP on uh, AWS than they have on standard frequencies. So is it, it's a frequency issue? Yeah, that's not a radio issue. It's just you have to have that frequency. People say that Apple could enable it, but Apple could do a lot of things. Right. Um. So it'll be interesting to see what the T-Mobile version of the iPhone can do. Does Apple do? They do do different SKUs for different carriers, right? They have three SKUs right now. They have one. There's, there's a variety. There's this line of thinking that Verizon demands their own SKU. Um, so no matter no matter what you do, if you make a world phone, you'll the have to make a world phone. The new version of the A1428 has been tweaked on the hardware side by Apple to support advanced awesome. wireless services on T-Mobile's network. Yeah. So they have three SKUs now, and it sounds like that'll that'll stay the same way. That's good news. Yeah. Will an iPhone 5 be actually better on T-Mobile with AWS? Uh, I guess it depends on the area you live in, which is usually the big defining right. factor it for a carrier. It might be here. Here's the other bit of good news that I, if I'm reading the the, the 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 news correctly, I believe that if you have a family plan, it's a it's a good price. You have five people on the plan. It's like 210 bucks for everything, and but it's genuinely unlimited data. They don't throttle you or any of that stuff. If you have an individual plan, then there's a throttling process where you know after a certain number of whatever data, they cut you off until the month kicks over to the new month or whatever. But for a family plan, I believe it's actually. Unlimited data, which is rare these days, uh, normally have to be grandfathered in or whatever, and that's keeping a lot of people on AT&T, for example. It, so that's good news. 
Yeah, so uh, at the event, John Legere said AWS for the iPhone 5. I think there's something where you get limited data plus is unlimited 2G, but you get a limited amount of 3G, and then the more expensive plan, you have a much higher or close, quote-unquote, unlimited Did, 3G. Have they support. announced pricing? Uh, I believe it was in the same announcement, okay. same event. Yeah, the new yep. carrier rate plans. Um, actually, they already went live. Contract-free pricing, $70 a month for unlimited data, talk, and text. That's a lot less than I'm paying. Yeah. And they have to. They're the fourth-place carrier. They're right. going to have to do something different to get attention and get customers. Yeah. Yep. Up to 12 gigabytes of hotspot data as well through tiers of up to $110 a month. So, um, interesting. I, I love seeing this. This is why you want competition. Yes. This is why yep. you didn't want them uh, to be purchased by uh, somebody. And I think this is great. Well, what about the new iPhone? June? Uh, now, now June. This is a Gene Munster, the the <laughs> highly respected analyst. Gene Munster says June. I heard August a couple weeks ago, and I and heard you, nothing, I trust. I've heard nothing to say that it that is coming. And August is a soft window because the further, the longer you are away, the the further small things can change the window. But it was sounded like August previously, and everything I've heard since then says sounds like late August. Sorry, late July, early August. How could Gene get this so wrong? Same reason he gets the Apple TV wrong every year. <laughs> A lot of it is facts to support a, a thesis wishful. and not the it's other way around. It's wishful thinking. Yeah. The, the, the amount of contradictory stuff I've heard about at least three different major Apple products over the past two months basically gets me go, okay, let's just say I don't know. It's going to happen sometime this year. I'm not going to say <laughs> when. There's very few financial analysts <laughs> who consistently provide accurate information because we're not their customers. Right. They're, they're not writing these things for us. Right. They're writing them for, uh, it's really a sales pitch yeah. in some ways. Or a market manipulation also, if you're less charitable. Also, yeah, and also needs to be said that Apple makes the the launch deliberately unpredictable. Uh, the last thing they want is for their, their competitors to know exactly well in advance when they're going to ship the next iPhone because that changes the whole uh, competitive dynamics. Right. They want it to be unpredictable. Well, but can, can I, I, I'm, I'm asking this as a, as a sincere question. <laughs> is there evidence that they are shifting that window to make it more, excuse me, to give, to deny their competitors an advantage and be able to predict a, a launch window? I've... I, I don't know. If, I, I Probably not. It just is a rational thing for yeah. the leader in an industry like this to do. I mean, they, they, would, they would be kind of foolish not to. Uh, and they do move it around a bit, but it's, it, it's, it just makes rational sense that they don't want uh, everybody to know exactly when they're going to ship. And it also, I think another little bit of soft evidence is that is the distance between when they announce their announcement date and when the announcement date actually is. They don't they don't say, oh, in four months we're going to be we're going to have a big announcement. No, they, they're saying in you know three weeks or whatever whatever it is. I don't know what the amount of time is, but it's a pretty small window. And uh, you know, it just makes sense that they. You know, they, they, they want to be somewhere between summer and the, the, the holidays. And, you know, they, there's a calculation there, but they don't want their competitors. I, I'm, I'm sure that they, they don't want their competitors to, to, to know exactly when that's going to be. Well, there's, there's like One a three-month window where they launch, they've typically launched. And that's why I think we see the HTC One and the Galaxy S4 in the spring, because it's so far away from Apple's window. They're not anywhere near it. Uh, they, Apple has announced, originally they announced at WWDC and they shipped in June and July and the last couple of years it's been September and October. Anything in those three months would not be surprising to me. And yeah, the, I, I, I don't think many people are expecting to see, it's as unpredictable as the launch has gotten, it still fits into a rather predictable slot yeah. of two or three months. Uh, we used to be thinking maybe we'll see something w, around WWDC, but even WWDC has become a soft target right now. Um, but it's uh, first half of the year would be almost impossible to uh, to to back as a rumor. But we still kind of know when things are going. I think it's kind of uh, it's weird. But most of these uh, most of the other manufacturers seem to be centering around some window after Mobile World Congress. Nobody yeah. wants to be launch a new phone in the middle of what used to be the premier event for mobile technology because there's too much noise there. But everybody seems to be huddling around that other th th that month or two that happens after it. Meanwhile, Google has their own hard scheduled event of uh, Google I.O., which is when they almost always take the wraps off of the next generation of the Android operating system. And probably that's going to be when they're going to be showing off a new Google, uh, a new uh, Nexus phone. Uh, so Or tablet. Uh, yeah, yeah. A tablet, but also they, also they have, they've they've probably have something that they're going to need to show off uh, at the uh, in in handsets at that time as well. And, and yet another wild card in the Apple Kremnology 
is that uh, Apple has been behaving differently lately around the competitive environment. I mean, they 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 got really uh, defensive about the uh, when the when the the, the Galaxy uh, S4 came out. Um, and they uh, they had this, this whole ad that came out that said, this is why the iPhone is really awesome. Remember how awesome the iPhone is? I mean, this is weird behavior for Apple. And so they seem kind of rattled by the, by the HTC One and some of the, you know, the, the new Galaxy yeah. and some of the other phones. Uh, and so I, I don't think Apple is predictable, as predictable as they used to be in terms of how they deal with their competition. It's not, it's not so much different behavior, but it's behavior they only used to do in the Mac market and now they're doing in the iPhone yep. market. Right. Uh, but the only way to get truly unpredictable with the phones is to go to multiple phones because then you can have two or three different releases in the year the way a Samsung does or another, or RIM is going to be, or BlackBerry is going to be doing. As long as there's one phone a year, um, because the realities of contract markets, they'll they'll fall in the same window. Yep. And how about the new iPad? Is that that? Uh, what's the date now on that? I think the big one maybe still spring and the spring. It, like this is spring. Well, we heard originally We're in April, spring. Aprilish. Um, if they can do it. Uh, the the challenge with the new iPads is they they have to make the iPad five the design language of the iPad Mini. Uh, and previously the choice was Retina display, battery life. Um, or uh, or the or the performance, and you you could choose two of those three, and no right. one wants an iPad that has five hours of battery life. Right. Uh, so getting that into an iPad Mini style package is hard. But we heard they were trying for April, and the Retina Mini sounds like it's not possible yet, which means that that would yeah. be an October uh, September Octoberish device. Could there be two announcements? Could there be a big iPad and a little iPad separate announcements? Yep, that's the advantage of having multiple products. Yeah. Apple, Apple, especially last year, they haven't shown any reticence about doing uh, about uh, decluttering uh, their release schedule and simply saying we've got one major product and we've got some software releases we can talk about at the same time. And when's so the, the Mac of, Pro coming out? <laughs> they said end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some news for Pro users. End of the year. And remember, you know, by, that, the, by the way. I'm sorry, go ahead, Andy. No, I'm sorry. I was going to make a wise-ass comment. And I, I, bet, <laughs> I, I bet you're going to say something more intelligent than what I had to say about the idea of... Uh, go ahead. Pro probably not. But what I was going to say <laughs> is that um, the, the, uh, it's, the, if we think it's difficult to predict now, just wait till Apple gets its new campus because their new campus comes with a shiny new room for announcing these right. things it's literally underground and it's not gonna you know we're not going to be able to see them putting up posters and and stuff at, at the right. in san francisco and all that stuff they're going to say okay we're going to have this event this afternoon everybody show up you you've got three hours to get here and it's just gonna these these announcements are going to come out of nowhere i i, I suspect and that's going to be a lot of fun Especially those of us who are journalists on the East Coast, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, you just come out. You'll get a high-speed maglev right from Boston right. to underneath the campus, Andy. <laughs> I don't think any of the four of us will ever be invited to these things. Yes, it doesn't uh, really matter. I know, I'm not. I uh, I uh, am going to do on Thursday, we do a show called Know How, where we show you how to do stuff. And I'm going to do take my existing uh, uh, mid-2010 Mac Pro, which is the last Mac Pro. So it's almost three years old now. And put in an SSD card and uh, put in a new video card. One thing I didn't know, and but from the research on this, I, I found out, and you knew this already, uh, Renee Ritchie, is that since 10.8 of uh, Mountain Lion, uh, you've been able to use stock PC video cards in Macs. I've heard this. I've never tried it. And, in fact, there's somebody in the chat room says, yeah, I've been using a, a NVIDIA 670 without any problems for some time, straight out of the... Uh, Straight out of the box. Now I went out and bought this ridiculously overpriced. It's like 150 bucks more than the same card from for a Windows machine. Uh, Sapphire makes a uh, Radeon uh, 7950. You paid Australian markup for that. I card. did. I played Australian <laughs> markup for it. Uh, so I'll put that in. But I might. I might get a. Um, I might see if I just go out and get an Nvidia stock Nvidia card. Run down to the store. Are there computer stores anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. Go to Egghead Software. No, they'll set oh, you up. shucks. Uh, with a nice VGA, EGA card. There's still a computer land in Berkeley, but I think all they do is fix computers. Anyway, if I can I find most one. Of, most of the computer stores mostly sell, like, Halloween costumes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Fry's is the last standout. Fry's? I was like, I have to drive down to Fry's? Yeah, you might be right. I might be right, yeah. You want to take a field trip, uh, Chad? Yeah, we'll, we'll record it. I wonder, I might be able to get it uh, overnighted from uh, Amazon. What if I order it now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I built my PC, um, I did New Egg, New Egg and um, uh, Amazon comparisons, and Amazon seemed to be cheaper on just You're kidding. everything. No. I always thought New Egg was like the best. And on top of that, I got free two-day shipping because I'm an Amazon Prime member, <laughs> so they got me there. So uh, which one should I get, the Gigabyte or the EVGA or the MSI? 
They're all the same. So many. Same prices. Simplify their SKUs. Uh, all right. Well, I'll order this. Just, you know, it's a it's an interesting experiment uh, to see, right? Just order them all, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> MSI has been really good. I have a... Uh, uh, I think they're all the same. Yeah, but you don't need Mac all, drivers. The point is Apple now yeah. bundles drivers for these cards. Um, so I, if I pay a little extra... I can get it Thursday. Wait a minute, isn't this Tuesday? Mm -hmm. What happened with the overnight? I guess it's it's too late in the day. Huh. Huh. Anyway, I don't want to waste your time with that. I'm sorry. Well, I should do a Hackintosh. You can do, you could make a Mac Pro Hackintosh, couldn't you? People do. Maybe there's, that's there's the actually, thing to do. There's, there's actually a very, very rich culture of people that are absolutely need that kind of a tower Mac performance with uh, with current uh, Intel processors. And having given up on waiting, there is a very, very massive culture on how to build those things with the uh, support forums and everything. All right, the anything, gigabyte anything I got, I could get the gigabyte. Mac OS will. Yeah. Uh, there's instructions for making it run Mac OS. All right, so that'll be another one. Since I mean, I'll have these cards. <laughs> I could just use them. <laughs> <laughs> But can you make one with Thunderbolt? Perfect face for radio. And our chat room says you can. That would be what I'd want is a Thunderbolt. That's what I did on know-how. You would already did it? Yeah. But it was it a, a Hackintosh? It was a Hackintosh. Why wasn't I watching? I don't know. Oh, I wasn't here that I, day. Yeah, it's because it was I was So wait a minute. Chad Johnson, day. you made a Hackintosh, which yeah. you back, probably turned back into a Windows machine. Right, I have. <laughs> but it, it had a Thunderbolt port. It has two Thunderbolt ports. I got the Gigabyte, uh, uh, the yeah. The, you got has, the one I just got, the 670? Uh, no, that's, well, the motherboard. Uh, uh, the I got the 6... 680? 80, I think, actually. Yeah, do of course. Video over Thunderbolt, do Chad? Better. Say again? Going to do video over Thunderbolt? You know, I haven't even tested it. Uh, it's like <laughs> You can put the port in. Yeah. yeah. Does it work? That's another matter. Yeah, because the video is... Because I, I have a signal. Thunderbolt display. Let's yeah. try it. I made I the Hackintosh, not. and then I am constantly in Windows playing video games. I, I heard you need a separate pass-through from the video card to send there's out the display. Some, there's some funky... Yeah. Yeah. There's a way to do this. All right. Well, hey, enough of that. A Macintosh that looks like a classic NES console. That's <laughs> what you got to do. It's worth it. I will give you. I'll give you a little preview. Uh, just, just a little preview. A little taste of what we're going to talk about uh, on um, Thursday on the Know How Show. I did. Um, I bought instead of buying an SSD that goes on the SATA uh, bus. I went. Uh, Other World Computing has an Express Card SSD, mm -hmm. and holy cow! That's the fast. It's much, much, much fast. It's like, it's like sixty percent faster than the SSD in in on an SATA bus. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> so if you're gonna do one upgrade, that'd probably be the best one. Yeah, see right there. But uh, you just scrolled past it. The Mercury Excelsior. Yeah, and you could put uh, as sticks get bigger. Those are just sticks. Yeah. So you could upgrade it down the road with a, with more memory as the sticks get bigger. Not cheap. Not cheap. But uh, it was almost 500 bucks for, for uh, what, 220 gigs? But boy, fast. And once you do it, you can never, ever go back. That's the problem. Yeah. You In fact, that was, really was, that was one of the reasons I stopped using the Mac Pro, because everything else I have is SSD. Yeah. And you kind of get used to that. Now, waiting for you can hear the drive. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. You know, it's like, I don't... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. It's like going back on dial-up. It is. It's a broadband. Speed, speed is so subject, subjective where you go, you have all these really antiquated benchmark tests that will tell you how much it can do floating point, how fast it can do floating point math when you realize that, well, most people, when they're using their computers, all that CPU power, all those 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 eight, eight cores are basically spent flashing the cursor while it waits for you to type <laughs> the next thing. And so it's something like something like a, a, a display refresh and uh, and hard disk access, a drive access is actually much more important than raw CPU power. I/O is everything. Yeah. So um, interesting article in Nine to Five Mac saying basically the Retina Mac Pro Retinas are junk. Don't buy them. They're horrible. They're troubled. They're troubled. I have loved mine from the day I got it. I haven't had ghosting. I haven't had any of the weird, as far as I can tell. I don't even want to read this too closely in case I do have it and I just don't know it. And now I'll see it and I won't like it anymore. I have tons of ghosting. I you do? Go, I cannot go to Daring Fireball without the window <sighs> looking transparent. But I, it doesn't bother me enough to have it changed yet. The yeah. the uh, article uh, written uh, by Jordan Kahn, MacBook Pro with Retina Display, Problems in Every Dimension. Apparently they use both LG and Samsung displays. The LGs have all sorts of problems LG. with ghosting. Um, even the Samsung uh, displays, according to uh, this article, aren't totally free from 
There was a, an update after that article that some people said it made it better, but I haven't tried it yet. A software update. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So the ghosting isn't like burn in on the display. No, it's weird. Like you just see the if there's a, a light colored image, you'll see the outline of the light colored image on top of the gray that you're seeing on. But the it screen. fades out. Yeah. There's an easy fix for it. Just uh, just bring back the flying toaster screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Apple actually has a, uh, a support article, TP949 image persistence test mm -hmm. that you can run. Uh, a display might show a temporary faint remnant of a previous image even after a new image replaces it. Follow instructions using procedure listed for this computer at the Apple support article TP949 to determine if it fails or passes this test. Now, this is for the genius to do, yeah. by the way. They do like a checkerboard pattern that yeah. switches. Yeah. Apple apparently isn't telling people. Um, even though they've had uh, this knowledge base article, I haven't seen it. So, but I now I don't I'm I don't want, I know I'm going to see look it. For it. Yeah, you'll, I'm going to see it. Right, yeah. I'm going to find it. Well, if you have one of those Samsung panels, that's good. You won't see it. But the problem is that uh, the geniuses. My not my understanding is the geniuses don't know what replacement part they're going to get. So even right. if you ask for a Samsung, you can't necessarily no get, get it. Yeah, and then some people had to switch multiple times and keep getting the same sort of ghosting panel. This is apparently a problem with IPS displays, particularly mm -hmm. this in plane switching, especially the ones made by LG. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it it is weird. I mean, I, I have the same I have the same problem. When I was reviewing the Retina MacBook as I did when I was talking about the, the the Chromebook Pixel, where you have a lot of respect for the hardware. You think it's a very impressive thing, but I find I had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out whom for whom I would recommend this, because as it was, it's a very peculiar notebook uh, that costs a hell of a lot of money, doesn't have a hell of a lot of features, has one absolute spotlight feature being that super high density display, <laughs> but it's hard to know for whom is that display going to be justify the disadvantages and the extra expense. Uh, I really did like uh, the, the piece that John Syracuse wrote a couple of weeks ago, likening it to that really high end for GM's uh, supercar that they make, knowing that the car company, knowing that this is not going to be the thing that they're going to sell in boatload quantities, but it's going to increase the luster and the allure of the whole brand. And hopefully this is going to be technology they can work out at this high end and then figure out how to trickle it down to the low end once it becomes more practical. It's but as it is, it's like, again, a really cool $2,500 laptop with no Ethernet port, but I'd much rather have so the, the extra 500 the, bucks in my pocket. The moral of the story is ignorance is bliss. It's it's better to not know anything about these problems, better to never yeah. try. I still uh, think this is the best devices. computer I've ever had, and I'm feeling like a, an idiot. I know, like, I, I own it, maybe I still I think that. Huh? Really? I, I, I own the computer. I, I have the ghosting. It doesn't bother me. It's my main computer. I love it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, Leo. You, it, you can't go back. I mean, if you look at a non, if you look at a MacBook that's not a Retina display, it looks horrible. It's like sandpaper now. on your eyes. Oh, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I had a, I had the Retina MacBook for a month, maybe two months on loan while I was reviewing it. Uh, I I could never go back to a non-Retina iPad. But a non-Retina Mac was, for me at least, no no difficulty. The thing is, like, I think Andy's right. These are aspirational products. And if you remember the very first MacBook Air, it wasn't right. It wasn't a great machine, but you could see where Apple was going. And now we have fantastic MacBook Airs. And yeah. you can see when the GPUs get better and the, the IPS displays get better, we'll have fantastic Retina Macs. I think I have to admit it that I've crossed some kind of spiritual and emotional Rubicon. I now have more money than cents. I bought a <laughs> Pixel as well. And I'm just spending money like... It's the best web browser you've ever owned. I know, but I like it. <laughs> I know. Well, see, I actually, I haven't got it fixed yet. compared to the Retina? I haven't got it yet. I'll let you know. Oh, okay. Because um, I got the nice LTE problem. version. I'm getting it April yeah. 8th, apparently. They've, they've, the, it's supposed the, to be the, the same panel, but wider. Yeah. The problem with the Pixel is that there are not as many opportunities to show off that display. I mean, what really, really sold the the Retina MacBook to me was the first time I was using Aperture and mm. realizing that I'm seeing every, as I'm trying to figure out how to fix this photo, I'm seeing every micron of detail uh, that's available yeah, in I this like dog's that. eyeball. Final but Cut it, Pro I, 2 I, is I, fantastic. I, I like that. Yeah. I've had this, I've had so this Sony. photo. One of my favorite photos is a photo of my one of my friend's dogs. It's an adorable dog. And this is the first time that I noticed that, oh, wow, you can actually see my reflection in the dog's eyeball. And that yeah. was just like, that wasn't one-to-one -one zoom. That was just like eight by 10 image that was in there. Like, all right, I suppose this is a very nice display. Yeah, I could never go back. I'm, I'm just so used to it now. Okay. Oh, I don't feel so bad then. Because, I mean, I, part of the reasons I buy these is because I'm going to review them. Yeah. I want to be able to talk about them responsibly. Um, but then you get hooked. And I this MacBook Pro with Retina... It feels like it's even faster than my Mac Pro. It is ridiculously fast. 
So all of this, so I haven't seen the ghosting. Maybe I'm not looking right. I'll look tonight. I render Final Cut Pro on my MacBook yes, Pro more it's than my faster. Pro. Yeah, it is. <laughs> There's also a, uh, you can put a thing in terminal to find out what panel you have. Right. Yeah. So, or even about this Mac, if you drill down, you can see right. what kind of panel you have. Be happy, Leo. It's a good machine. The first chapter, Steve Jobs' manga previewed online. I know this is one that Andy Anako is fascinated by. Are you a manga? Are you an anime fan? Uh, not really, because I, I've, I've had friends who've tried to like get me into manga, and at some point, either A, the story is all about the green, mysterious, glowy thing that re represents the vengeance of the Earth uh, against humanity that keeps trying to poison it, or it gets really, really creepy, and I have to burn it and pretend that I never actually saw that image. <laughs> <laughs> this looks pretty good. This yeah. is by, um, it's in Japanese, um, by uh, I think, war. I think that was the sugar water scene. Is it? Oh, with, with, oh yeah, he's walking in the woods with Scully. You're yes. right. Right yes. at the top there, yeah. Wow. I don't know. That's kind of cool. It's better than the Kutcher movie. It it's, has to it's be. It's got to be yes. better than the Ashton Kutcher movie, which has now apparently just been uh, <laughs> Limbo, killed, yeah. limboed. They showed it at uh, Sundance, and then they suddenly said, we want to put together a marketing plan for this, so we won't release this right that away. That 70s show reunion is looking like a better idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna to delay it until everybody forgot what Steve Jobs It was really was like. like. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to wait till Waz is dead so he can't say how stupid the movie was. Uh, then uh, the uh, there's the Aaron Sorkin yep. Sony version, which I presume they're uh, busy hard at work at. But this looks better. There are no tentacles in this. No. <laughs> no nuns. There are no. spectacles. No. And the eyes are kind of normal sized. I think that he actually looks like Steve, which is kind of nice. It's a good job. They even look like John Scully. I mean, you could identify it as John Scully from the picture. Yeah, so, absolutely. This looks good. I can't wait to uh, read it. I hope that they have an English translation. And on, on iBooks or Kindle would be nice. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Comixology, right? Yeah. Did you ask them at Comixology when you visited with them, Andy? Uh, I did not ask them about manga. Uh, although they're doing, they're, they're doing, they're doing some really incredible things. It's like they're moving. Uh, it's uh, they showed me, they showed me the, uh, the last time I visited their offices was a year ago. So they, I got to see their new larger offices, which they're now moving out of because they're moving into even larger Large. offices. Wow! Uh, in the next few weeks, comics next have few a months. future. Yeah, they're 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 doing really well. So as so, so long as they, so long as they can get Dark Horse Comics in the in the stable at some point. That's going to be that's that's going to run the table. That'd be yes. great. Real quickly, let me just run through a few stories. We got a a, a bunch of uh, students here uh, in the uh, live studio, and they're getting bored to tears. So I don't I want I, I don't want them to get too. There's three young ladies in the front row. This is good. Like, uh, when is this going to be over? I, <laughs> I am can, not I can, a geek. I can go get my baseball cap and wear it sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'll help. We don't want to get warm. <laughs> Quicksilver's back. It's out of beta for the first time in 10, 10 years. years. 1.0. This is the program Alcor started writing, uh, w which I put on every machine because I love it. Uh, then Google uh, bought Alcor or hired Alcor, and, and another team took it over, as kind of, I guess, as an open source project. And it's out, 1.0. And I immediately took Alfred off of my uh, MacBook Pro with Retina Display and put Quicksilver back. It's just a nostalgia trip. But yeah. I've always liked Quicksilver. I think Absolutely. Quicksilver is wonderful. Um, so just something you might want to take a look at. Department of Defense will be purchasing 650,000 iOS devices. They've denied that subsequently. Oh, come on. Admit it, DOD. <laughs> uh, there is an OS X Trojan that Apple has blocked in their, uh, in their P list already. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about it. It injects ads or forces you to go to you know, pages uh, in your browser. Um, Han Hai posting record profits making Apple products. And I think that's uh, anything else. The, uh, we, we could, the Apple tax, Apple says the reason why it costs so much for Apple stuff in Australia is because the rights, it's all the rights holders' faults. That's why we charge 70% more. Adobe probably says the same thing. We remember this is, uh, this is the conversa conversation we had about uh, Adobe charging so much for their creative or for their uh, software. Um, well, the software has to be imported. It has to be put on a ship and sent across the ocean. <laughs> I have to buy it a plane it's, ticket. It's the freight expense. That's it. You have, you have to print all those manuals. <laughs> that, that, that Adobe software is heavy. Heavy. That's a lot of, yeah. That's a lot of three and a half yeah. copies, man. Eric yeah. Schmidt says it's up to Apple to get Google. That was the worst story now of last week. <laughs> on yeah. uh, the iPhone. It's up to, it's not us, it's Apple. Did you follow that story, Leo? 
That was horrendous last week. So what happened? So Eric Schmidt said that he was asked about Google Now, and it was at a conference in India, and he said you have to ask Apple. And people started to wonder, what, what do you mean you have to ask Apple? Is Apple coding it? No. Uh, is it, did it? So everyone thought, oh, Google submitted it, and Apple put it in a drawer somewhere, just like they did with, you know, took their time with Maps, took their time with Google right. Voice. And then Apple put out a statement saying, uh, Google Now has not been submitted to the store. So people said, Apple's lying. It's not coming as Google Now. It's coming as an update to Google Search. Apple must be lying. And then Apple said... We don't have any products from Mountain View in review. And then finally, Google came out and said, we have not submitted this to Apple. Oh. And finally then, some people started to believe Apple, that really they weren't doing anything evil with Google now. But after, right. Well, thank you, Eric. So Eric misstated the uh, case. Which he has wanted to do. He's done this several times. He's Mr. Foot and Mouth. He doesn't get to go to the meetings anymore. Yeah. I, I heard. <laughs> I was watching Mac Break Weekly. <laughs> it's like we were, we were shocked that Apple stopped using our map. Shocked, shocked were we? Shocked. I read uh, TMZ.com. <laughs> okay, so there you go. So, I, you know, if you want Google now, get an Android device. It'll work better anyway because yeah. it's never going to have access to the things that it needs to have access to on the Apple side, in my opinion. It'll be a neutered version. It'll be neutered. Um, let's take a break. When we come back, our software picks of the week, some very good news. I hope I didn't steal anybody's Quicksilver tip. Nope. Mike Elgin in Valencia, Spain. Mr. Rene Ritchie from Montreal visiting via imore.com. And Andy Anako from Boston. More of MacBreak Weekly in just a moment. But first, a little word from Pond5. You know, I was reading about the, the Fufara. Um, you know, there was a company called iStock Photo that was purchased by Getty Images. And the guy who founded iStock Photo was later fired by Getty Images because he was complaining that it was so expensive that they took such a big stake yeah. out of it and now he's starting kind of some sort of boutique -y stock image thing and i had to think boy you know that's why i like pond five pond five he was saying we're gonna on this new boutique thing we're gonna give 50 percent royalties pond five's been doing that all along that's what i love about pond five pond five treats everybody in the transaction with respect what is pond five it is a stock media marketplace media for people who make media for both sellers and buyers. In fact, Pond5 told me that uh, almost uh, like the majority of Pond5 users both sell and buy stock media here. This is what we call royalty-free. That means you pay for it once. You can use it in your presentations, on your website, in your podcast, wherever. They've got a huge collection. I'm not surprised because media makers love Pond5 because they get to set their own price and they get 50%. That's, that's industry-leading royalties. You're going to get 1.5 million stock videos to choose from, 8.2 million photos, 753,000 vector illustrations, 383,000 music and sound effects tracks. They've got 3D models. They've got After Effects uh, projects. And their browser makes it so easy to find what you want. Chad's using it right now just to browse around inside Pond5. Couldn't be easier. Every week there's a free stock clip, so you should go to pond5.com. This week, it's Particles with Alpha Channel. I don't even know what it is, but it's a 1080p clip that costs you nothing. Look, I don't know what that is. It's pretty, though. You see, that'd be good for, like, your PowerPoint or your keynote presentation. Green screen background. And the Alpha Channel means that that black part will be transparent when you bring it into... Oh, uh, dude. Yeah, so you can put that on. over video if you wanted, like, some dream Ooh. sequence or something like that. See, you know how to use this stuff. Yeah. We got a special deal for you. When you go to pond5.com slash MacBreak... They've got 50, count them, five zero uh, free stock media files for you to use, all for yourself, forever and ever. Audio, sound effects, pictures, videos. It's a way, you know, you get two things out of this. First of all, you get this great library of stuff you can use. No, and, and the watermark's not in the stuff when you download it. But, but secondly, uh, it gets you introduced to Pond5 to the media browser, sign you up for an account, free account, so that you, next time you need media, you, it's easy and fast for you to get an image or a sound effect, or whatever you need from Pond5. you got to try it. Pond5.com slash MacBreak. Pond5.com slash MacBreak. Get your 50 free media files now. It's a limited time offer, so do not delay. Time for our picks of the week. We'll start to my left, Mr. Andy Inotko. Uh, this is not necessarily a software pick, not even necessarily specifically an Apple stuff pick, but this is the Roku 3 which yeah, I'm baby. Very much in love with right now. Me too. Uh, because it's got a it's got a honk off people at Apple that this is actually a little bit smaller than the Apple TV. Uh, very very functionally similar. You've got the streaming media box. Uh, it has got you know Ethernet uh, HDMI. Also has a uh, 
uh, a storage slot so that you can add your own media and add your own storage there. Um, I love it because they've, they've, they've added they've added some nice features with this one. Uh, new interface that's a lot easier to navigate. Also, the <laughs> remote is really nicely done where uh, it's actually a Wi-Fi device, not an infrared device. So it doesn't really, you can put, if you don't want to have this perched on top of a shelf any, anywhere, you can actually hide it if you'd like, because as long as it's within radio distance, uh, it'll actually work. So it doesn't matter where you're pointing it. Also, the remote has one of these on the side of it. It actually has a headphone jack. So you can be like in bed with your own headphones plugged in, and you're the only person in the, in, in, in the room who can actually hear uh, what you're doing. Um, and it, whether it's it's an interesting choice for someone who is an Apple person because there will always be a definitive <laughs> advantage to Apple TV in that it will always be an airplay receiver. Uh, and so that I think is if you have if you spend any amount of time uh, with uh, with uh, information that's uh, excuse me uh, content that's on your uh, on your Mac MacBook or your or iPhone or your iPad, I do think that's a definitive advantage. However, uh, the great thing about uh, about uh, the uh, about the Roku box is that they're a little bit more open in terms of the number of channels. You don't have a YouTube player that kind of bites, but you do have things like an Aereo app. So once Aereo, that really great oh, that's uh, cool. streaming streaming broadcast uh, TV app, uh, comes it becomes available in your city, and it's going to be available in 22 more cities at the uh, by the end of the spring. I just installed it uh, on this device uh, yesterday, and the ability of I've attached this $99 Roku box to any TV I have, and now I've got every channel that's being broadcast. I've also have access to DVR content uh, everywhere. Uh, it's such a nice thing. Uh, that I, I think that Aereo, if you're in an Aereo city, that doesn't necessarily negate the advantage of Apple TV with AirPlay, but man, that's a strong counter argument to that feature. Or you if you're a Time Warner right. subscriber, because they have an app that gives you live TV on it right. too. And again, that, that that really is like the the systemic advantage of Roku, and that they are more open to third-party channels. They have a curated store uh, of free channels with all of the usual suspects. That is already a large. Exactly. That, that, that's already a wider palette of options than you get on Apple TV. But also you can get sort of off books channels, uh, including the Aereo channel, including uh, 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 all kinds of other features that will give you PBS and CNN uh, and uh, BBC uh, International uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so, again, not 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 exactly a slam dunk, uh, but it's 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 an interesting step forward. I, I keep saying that uh, to cut the, to finally cancel your cable subscription uh, and get all your TV off the Internet it's not a single decision you make. It's more like it's a game you're playing in which once you get 100 points, you cut cable. I was Before I got Roku 3 and installed Aereo on it, I was at 93 points. Now I think I'm at 96, 97 points. I'm really, it would only take one more thing to complete a piece of the puzzle for me to cancel cable now. Uh, and that's really due to uh, Roku 3. There's a Roku channels database, www.roku-channels.com, that lists a lot of these off-book Roku channels. Yep. And in most cases, you just need to go to a website and enter a code to add it to uh, your Roku. Um, yeah. And there's and, and, thousands and, and, of channels, or hundreds anyway, of channels. Yeah, and, 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 there, and the, the fact that it's so open is the reason why it's so easy to uh, it's it's so easy to sort of get a, get around whatever limitation you think there is about it. For instance, uh, no, you can't get uh, you can't get AirPlay streaming, but what you can get is home uh, install a home media server anywhere on any of your Macs or PCs in the in the in the whole house, and now that can be a receiver for all of that content anywhere. So that doesn't negate the disadvantage of not having AirPlay, but in many ways, for many people, that's going to sort of equal uh, the the sort of features you're going to get from it. Yeah, that's so. you know that's kind of the trade off exactly is you don't get out iTunes store, you don't get AirPlay. It's not an Apple-specific device. My mom is visiting, right? She's 80 years old. She's a little deaf. I I set her up with headphones in the uh, remote control. She could turn up as loud as she wants. It's wonderful. She's got a little TV in her in her uh, room. It's just great. Yeah. Um, I love that. And the sound quality is excellent on the wireless. I was surprised. I thought there'd be latency or some degradation, but uh, it sounds really good. Yeah. Impressive. Good recommendation. 99 bucks. Roku... R O K U Labs dot com. How about you, Mr. Renee Ritchie? What do you like these days? Uh, Not your Z ten. No, I have I do have a Z ten here somewhere. <laughs> One of these pockets. All Canadians have to have by have law. Have, yeah, you have to have a Blackberry, have by, have a Blackberry. Uh, by law. It's part yeah. of our subsidy it's like healthcare. Yeah. 
Um, my pick is it's not a new app, but it's a, an app that was updated today. I'm going to ask the chat room to help me. If you could at Rene Ritchie on Twitter, we'll demonstrate it. Ooh. But Twitterific, uh, some would say finally launched push notifications this morning. Ah. They're doing it gradually because they don't want their server to smat to uh, crash and burn overload. But if you install a new Twitterific and you turn on push notifications, and they've added almost little emoji looking, uh, I'll see if I can show any of them here, little emoji looking icons to them. So you can see. Uh, it's a little recycle symbol if it's a retweet. It's a, a little, here they come, little uh, diamond if it's a oh, that's uh, neat. mention. Uh, and they're doing, oh, where should I hold this? Uh, this way. Testing, there what is are. this? Testing notifications for what program now? Uh, Twitterific. 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 Um, and it, it's really well done. It's, they're coming in very quickly. The, I like the little icon there because it shows me immediately what kind of message it is. Those are all mentions. There's a... Uh, Someone who followed me on Twitter is the green the green plus sign. Uh, well, you could fill up your uh, you could fill up your notifications pretty quick there. <laughs> you you, can, you don't have to turn them all on. It's very granular. I'll open up the app so that you can see. But it's it's very like the Icon Factory Oops. takes a lot of attention. <laughs> like they, they spend a lot of time on the details of the app, and they weren't the first to do push notifications, but they've done a really really good job of it. So I'm going to open up the uh, like that. Might want to change your passcode now. Yeah, you gave away your that, passcode, but uh, somebody's got to get your phone. It's a traveling phone. passcode, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's not yeah. a it's not a huge deal. Uh, if I go to my my account here and I click on my uh, where's my settings, right here. Having user well, it's nice error you can issues. get those server alerts without using your any of your text messages you've got in your data plan. Um, you you can <clears throat> I'm doing a very poor job of it here, but you can granularly set which notifications you want. You can turn them on so it's just mentions or just retweets or just favorites. Uh, and they have another thing I should mention about Twitter is not all Twitter apps have good accessibility. A lot of them render things to the frame buffer to make them move very quickly. Twitterific is using standard control, so all the good, good stuff that iOS does for voiceover support good. and for other support, uh, it is all in there. Um, I learned that when I got the Retina display, that uh, how many I was surprised how many apps just kind of did a JPEG kind of of yeah. the of the, of the <laughs> tweets. Uh, Lauren Brichter, the guy who did the original tweet, he did that. He would just render. He made tweet for that, and it, it flows. The tweet made bot it fast, guys, so fast. But the tweetbot have, have gone back now and added the accessibility back yeah. in. But the Icon Factory has always been very good about being really first class citizens. I think that's the way you should. Uh, and all stuff. And a lot of people didn't go with Twitterific simply because it didn't have push notifications. It was like the right. last big hurdle. And now they've added that. And again, it, you'll get in in batches. They're not making you wait in line. There's no queue, uh, but they'll, you can enable it. And when they have the server capacity for it, it'll start working. Tweetbot does have notifications. I just had to dig Tweetbot into has, it. It does have notifications. They, have, they were one of the first to have a really robust, really right. good set of, no, of push notifications for Twitter. That's what I've been using. But I love Twitterific and I love Icon Factory. So I'm and glad. And the design that, is just beautiful. Yeah, the it's gorgeous. Fly. Yeah, it's pretty. It's David dark. Lanham, love that. Yeah. Very flat. Very nice. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mike Elgin in Valencia, yes. well, what's your recommendation? I have a, well, I have a very uh, counterintuitive recommendation. When I was a Windows user, uh, I was uh, for three or four months before I switched to the uh, Mac uh, world from the PC, I was really getting into Dragon Naturally Speaking, <laughs> which is a, a, a dictation software that lets you, you know, control your your interface with uh, with your voice. And then I switched to Mac, and then you know it's, it's expensive, so I didn't buy it again, and so on. And then when Mountain Lion came out, they there's actually built-in speech recognition in Mountain Lion. A lot of people don't know this is in there, and so part of my recommendation is for people to learn and, and f sort of force themselves to get in the habit of using speech dictation because it's wonderful once you have that habit. Uh, and that's the general uh, tip. And look for it in Mountain Lion. Just hit function key twice and you can and start talking. And it's similar to um, to what you find in, on the iPhone and, and iPad. It's not great. You don't have to train it. Um, it works pretty well. Uh, but again, the biggest hurdle is the is developing the habit. My specific recommendation is that I finally bit the bullet and purchased Dragon Dictate 3, which is the current version from Nuance, of their uh, speech uh, uh, dictation software. It's expensive. It's 200 bucks. The purchasing process is counter is you know from the 90s uh, and it's you know antiquated. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and all that stuff, and then you have to train it. So all those things are things that kind of have people don't do that kind of stuff anymore, uh, especially since a pretty good dictation software is free in Mountain Lion. But I still recommend it for anybody who is a blogger or who writes or who 
does a lot of email or whatever, because once you've trained it and gotten in the habit of using it, it's fantastically good to be able to just talk and have things written for you without without typing. It's also can be healthy because I like to um, sometimes dictate while I'm standing up. Uh, we all sit too much probably, and that's bad for your health. Uh, and and the other uh, the other benefit is that there's a free app that goes with it called Dragon Recorder. And what you do with Dragon Recorder is you open the app, you start talking, you can sit there and record for, you know, half an hour, and you're giving commands like, you know, next paragraph, and you put in the punctuation commas, periods, and all that stuff. And then when you go back to your, to your Mac, you plug it in, and it all uploads, and then you've got the document that you spoke uh, all laid out. So this is great also for exercise because you can go take a walk, and when you come back, you've got, uh, you've got a column written uh, or a blog post written or an email written. So it's it's really fantastic, and for people who are willing to put up with the price and the training, it's there's nothing like it. Very cool. Um, well, I have to say it's I've done it again. Uh, you know, I have I think an, a, a not or unearned reputation for when I buy something, uh, then Apple releases yes. the new thing. So on February eighteenth, uh, I I bought the entire Nick software collection for Aperture <laughs> and Lightroom. What are you laughing at? Thank you, Leo. February eighteenth, <laughs> I bought it two three hundred dollars for the, the full collection because I had I needed a, I had bought it before but I needed update silver effects and there were a few updates. So today Google announces <laughs> the whole collection just one hundred forty nine dollars. Thank you, Leo. Uh, yeah, you could thank me later. Actually, the good news is they've sent out an email and they said anybody this is amazing. Praise Google. I was very worried when Google bought Nick. We thought they wanted Snapseed, which is the iOS app, and uh, probably didn't care about these yeah. plugins, which many photographers agree are the best plugins available for Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture. Uh, their Silver Effects Pro is absolutely the best monochrome uh, plugin. Just amazing. Um, and so we were all a little worried. Oh, my God, what's, gonna, what's Google going to do with the desktop? Then they killed Snapseed for the desktop a couple of days ago, and I thought, uh-oh. Well, here's the good news. Anybody who's purchased Nick software in the last five years gets an upgrade. And those of us who stupidly <laughs> purchased it for $300 just a few weeks ago get a refund. <laughs> and if and I highly recommend this. The full Nick collection it includes a bunch of plugins. Uh, U.S. customers uh, or EU, um, but the price is $149. And uh, it is just, you know, for, for Silver Effects Pro 2 by itself is worth it, but they have a bunch of other stuff. These are really great plugins at $149. You can try before you buy. Recommend that if you use Lightroom or Aperture or, uh, or uh, Photoshop. Certainly worth taking a look at. 15 day free trial. Thank you, Google, for not only not killing Nick software yeah. and not only dropping the price to half what it was, but for honoring those of us who've been spending money on Nick software for years. <laughs> Uh, we get a little bit of a benefit. Uh, Thanks, Leo, for triggering it for the rest of us. I can't believe this. I really don't think this is true, that when I buy stuff, new stuff comes out. I really don't. But if a Mac Pro comes out in the next two weeks, <laughs> and I've spent $1,500 to upgrade my old Mac Pro, you can thank me for that, too. Hey, I thank you for uh, making the trip to the Brick House, Renee Ritchie, iMore.com. If you want to keep up on the rumors about the iPhone and them, uh, you just showed me something that is great, which you cannot put on this site. you got great sources. And uh, can, Great I get, can I get a quick plug-in? Yeah. We were thrilled. We had the chance to interview Don Melton uh, earlier this week. If you're not familiar with him, he's the one who open he was responsible for helping to open source Mozilla. Um, he also made Nautilus for GNOME. And then he was hired by Scott Forstall, <laughs> and he created WebKit and Safari for the Mac. He's and the then guy. The tib. Yeah. And he was really candid. It's, it's at imore.com slash debug. Uh, he was really candid in the interview. He spoke a lot about how the project... He's not he at chose, Apple now, right? He retired last yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, he talked why they chose Conqueror as the foundation, like HTML, KG, KML, uh, sorry, KJS. But all that Conqueror stuff. became WebKit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know about spoilers, but I believe the Gecko code was close to being bigger than the OS X code when they were first <laughs> looking at it. And that was that was a no-go for uh, for Bertrand Soleil. Oh, so, this is great. Yeah, it, it was a fantastic hour and a half, and we were really thrilled to have him. And if you're a fan of, if you use WebKit, which includes the Android browser, the BlackBerry browser, WebOS, Everybody uh, Nokia is changing to it. Yeah, Home. he's a guy you have a lot of thanks for yeah, uh, for yeah. that technology. Debug Eleven, that's the uh, podcast uh, that Renee does at iMore. One of the podcasts that Renee does at iMore. 
And uh, debug number 11 has Don Melton. I'm going to definitely put that on my phone and listen to that on the way home. That's great. Can't wait to hear that. Thrilled to have him. I-M-O-R-E.com, folks. That's a great site. We want to thank Mr. Mike Elgin for uh, making the trip in from Valencia, Spain. Thank you. So great to Thanks have you. You can follow Mike on thank Google+. You. Plus. Uh, or just go to MikeElgin.com. It'll take you to his Google Plus page. Yes, it will. And uh, anything else you want to plugs? Well, I'm now, uh, in addition to Cult of Mac, Computer World, Datamation, and House, I'm now writing for Cult of Android. <laughs> I'm sure this audience will be thrilled. How? Uh, how do you that. have an Android phone? I do. I have an Android phone and an Android tablet, and uh. I'm looking at a Pixel. So um, I, I can actually... Um, um, I'm actually going to try to go all Google, uh, starting in a couple of weeks, 100% uh, Google hardware, 100% Google software, and compare it to what I have now, which is 100% Apple everything, and sort of mix and match and see what the, the benefits and uh, hardships are uh, with, uh, with that. It's going to be temporary. It's, I'm going to do it for one month. Awesome. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. doing the same thing. That's why I bought the Pixel. I thought I, I should give it a try. Yeah. I tried Windows 8. Can't be any worse than that. <laughs> no, it cannot. Andy Anako, Chicago Sun Times. He is uh, the king of Mac uh, analysts, and it's always great to have you on, hatless or not. What is that? Uh, oh, you took down the sorting bin that was on your oh. iPad there. What oh. was that? Was it uh, to... Tootsie no, Pops? Was at... It was. No, I was at. Uh, uh, those are multi... <laughs> I was at the Pax East uh, over the weekend, uh, and so those are like gaming die. Oh, they're die. Uh, at... D20s. Multi-sided die. Yeah, yeah now I can like see. Every color, every size. Wow. And oh, of cool. course, this was just like one bin of like 40 at this one retailer had. Uh, those are the only ones that aren't made out of like the bones of dead gods. The, those, <laughs> they keep those under glass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. We do Mac Break Weekly, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC Tuesdays at twit.tv. If you can watch live, we would love it. But if you can't, we've got on-demand audio and version and video versions uh, available after the fact at twit.tv and wherever podcasts are aggregated, twit.tv slash mbw. Now, everybody, get back to work because break time. Oh, we, I forgot to uh, thank uh, our uh, fine studio audience, uh, Matthew Seth and his. And Matthew, what school are you guys from again? Uh, Kimball High School. Kimball High School. Where's that located? Tracy, California. Tracy, California. They were engaged, they were involved, they were watching. Only a few of them fell asleep. I was very impressed. And they didn't storm the stage. And they didn't storm the stage. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. But you still have 30 seconds left. Uh, <laughs> it's not over, is it? <laughs> it could happen. Uh, thank you for joining us. Now get back to work. Break time is over. <laughs>